Hi, I am Michael. I am a small business owner, fledgling improv artist, a bit manic and a bit neurotic, but who isn't? I am a TV host and your host right now for what we call the Second Scene Podcast. It's a dweebs global production where we interview people you know, but about things that they're not necessarily known for. So I'm here today with Robin Laird. She is well known as a fashion model and photographer where she's walked the runways in many countries around the world and shot high fashion magazine editorials. But today we're here to talk about her second scene. She is a biochemistry master who started her own company called Health Curious, where she enables people to perform at their best through strategic lifestyle tweaks, coaching them to better, healthier, and more fulfilling lives. So please welcome Robin Laird to the show. Thank you so much, Michael. What an introduction. (laughs) (laughs) Does that that describe you? Is that? (laughs) Yeah, it does. Um, It does describe me. The the little bit you said about health curious is also just about my more my health coaching philosophy and and health curious is actually it's more specific digital platform that was born out of that um, idea of helping people sort of be the best versions of themselves uh but we can touch more upon that later okay all right sounds great i look forward to hearing more about it um so you you've lived many lives it seems like and you've lived in many places (laughs) where where are you originally from so i grew up in los angeles but for some reason i have never felt um that that i've always felt like a global citizen and i think that has to do with the fact that i was raised with uh um, a Dutch mother and a father who lived a lot of his life in the Netherlands. So I, I've i just always been very globally minded. And the second that I could, I started traveling. Um, and I didn't go very far for university. I actually stayed in LA. But during that time, during the summers, I was traveling, either doing internships abroad or backpacking by myself. And then I got the opportunity to model abroad. And I jumped on that because I, I yeah, I've just been called to the rest of the world and I now live in Amsterdam um, but I'm already feeling itchy to 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 discover a new city soon so um, yeah I don't know where that came from but uh, I think being raised by sort of Dutch bilingual parents really helped yeah okay did they speak to you uh, do you know multiple languages are you I yeah so I do speak Dutch with a, a nice American accent um, <laughs> but I yeah, I, even more than the languages of a place, uh, I just love people and human beings. As, as a, a cliche as that sounds, I love to travel and just have these universal connected moments. And some of my favorite places to travel are actually places where I don't speak the language at all. And you just have to connect with, you know, words and smiles. And, and I, I remember when I was in China, also a backpacking trip, realizing that the numbers that we take for granted, you know, counting on our finger, one, two, three, are completely different in China. And, and I thought I was ordering one bottle of water, but it looks kind of like this, which is nine or something. And all of a sudden I ordered nine bottles of water and, and these little moments that are just so kind of figuring out, they're kind of childlike, figuring out how to communicate with another human is so much fun. So oh. I prefer not speaking the same language as someone almost. Yeah, you, you like, yeah. yeah. At least you weren't ordering like nine bottles of wine by vodka, yeah. or vodka <laughs> or <yeah>. wine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What is the uh, what's the situation out there right now in the Netherlands? I mean, the Netherlands is is blessed in its small size and its organization. It's very well organized country, and the government is also well organized. So I think things have been. Um, It's been certainly a lot more relaxed than in the United States, uh, which is, I think for better or for worse, sometimes Dutch people, they're very down to earth and they don't like to hype things up too much. Uh, But obviously in the wake of a global pandemic, sometimes a little bit of hype can be beneficial. But overall, I, I, um, I think it's, they've done a pretty good job of keeping things under wrap here and people are now more or less living normal lives with masks on in the trains and in the trams. But most people are just, you know, you live quite locally in this country. Everyone bikes around. And, and how is it over there? <laughs> it is. It is. Well, I mean, we, we have mask debates here. So I think yeah. that's, I, I'm, yeah. not sure, I'm guessing that's one of the reasons why we're not completely back to normal, but I'm really not sure. Yeah, it's, it's going to be an interesting time to look back on historically. Um, mm-hmm. 
it's always hard to make any sort of assessments while things are happening. But I, I yeah, I look forward to looking back on this period. You know, that, uh, that's, so true. that's so true. Yeah. I can't tell you how many times I've been like, I am for sure about this. And, you know, six months later, you look back on the situation. You're like, wow, was yeah. I wrong? Was I? Yeah, yeah. I'm, really looking forward to re- I'm looking forward to restaurants getting back to normal. Can you guys go out to eat there? Yeah, so restaurants, everything is a bit spaced out, but restaurants, you can go out to eat. Um, it, yeah, and, and, and in the Netherlands, there's also this culture of, it's called terrace culture. If you translate it directly, it's just people sit out on terraces. So during the summer, no one is sitting inside. Also at a restaurant, you're out sort of into the street on the sidewalk. And I think that's actually been quite COVID friendly in that they just place the tables a bit farther away from each other and you're outdoors. So that it kind of works with the Dutch summer culture anyways. That, that's so nice. Maybe, maybe America will adopt that. I mean, I, I've eaten in a lot of restaurants and parking lots. Oh, they've converted really? their parking lots into wow into yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> maybe not as scenic as a, a canal in amsterdam but <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> creative nonetheless Def- yeah. definitely not definitely not <laughs> <laughs> how did you get started in modeling so i am five eleven and a half so basically almost six feet walking around uh los angeles constantly just having Uh, people tell me I should model. It's basically what's called scouting. And so I've just um, been used to always being this very tall person. Then I I never really followed through with any of it until I was in university. I was at a thrift uh, thrift store, yeah. And I was contacted by a photographer or approached by a photographer. And uh, she said, would you like to model for American Apparel? And I I, you know, I've heard, I had heard some strange things about American Apparel and I had also just felt like, was this a legitimate offer? But I, you know, being a university student thought, why not? And I went with my mom actually to that photo shoot and it was completely legitimate, completely fun, took pictures in about 50 different colors of the same (laughs) t-shirt. And that was sort of how I began modeling. And then I went uh, while I was just kind of freelancing, not with an agency yet, Uh, modeling for Brandy Melville, another brand that was local to Los Angeles. And then I ended up getting scouted and signed to an agency in LA. And that ultimately turned into an agency in New York and then in Paris and London and Mexico. And so that sort of, yeah, I I think just being really tall really (laughs) helps me literally stand out (laughs) from the crowd and, and be scouted in the street. I think how that that's actually how a lot of models get started. Gotcha, gotcha. You kind of, you skipped over the walking in with your Polaroids and Well, that that is oh no, no, you don't skip that. So, oh, it's so still part of it. You, <laughs> that's a daily part of modeling. So once you have an agency, then you go to clients constantly at um castings and auditions and then you bring your 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 comp cards is what they're called, just pictures of yourself and you sort of if you're doing a fashion show, you have to walk for them. Uh, so there's plenty of auditioning afterwards, but this is just really you're into the world is typically getting signed with an agency. Although that is changing now with Instagram and social media, people are able to have more freelance careers. I guess people are creating their own careers now. They, they... Absolutely. Yeah. Wow. And, and, and it's also seeping into model, you know, the traditional um, modeling career of just showing up and being a good model is no longer enough. They actually immediately want to see how many followers followers you have on Instagram. You know, do you have a YouTube following? And that just uh, immediately sort of, that's kind of a prerequisite now almost for modeling. Wow, so you have, you have to be an influencer. You, you, Basically, yeah, it's all wow. blending together. Oh, Crazy. wow. Crazy, yeah. Well, I don't know how you handled walking in with that. I, I had a, a girlfriend when I was like 20 and her mom mm-hmm. that wanted me to try. And I remember them taking Polaroids, me and going uh, somewhere, shopping it around. I don't know how you do that. Cause that was like the, I couldn't take like handing it off to people and then knowing that they were just like examining me. You get to a point where you no longer, you're, you're such, you yourself are such an object, at least physically that you get to a point where you just sort of dissociate <laughs> And, and, and you have to realize that also if you don't book a job, it's, it's not something personal to who you are at the core. It's your look wasn't right. Um, I think that's a good way to think about it. But you get in some ways very uh, resilient <laughs> and you just can take rejection, no problem. Um, and yeah. 
I guess you, you know, you do, you get used to the camera and you get used to other things like that. It's, it's true. I remember the first time I was in like a short film and all I had to do was walk across the screen and it was uh, like, my legs were like wobbly. And I was like thinking about every move, like my body was making, I was the most awkward, like walk, like I couldn't do it. Like it was, yeah. Yeah. It's funny how, how once, when you're aware of that, you're being captured in some way, you automatically start to change. And actually that's the key to being a good model is to, not care and to just be even if you kind of have to fake it till you make it just be confident and try things as if no one was watching almost <laughs> and then that you know it's it's funny how those things are, are so simple and yet so hard <laughs> oh yeah oh yeah no i, for, I do an announcing gig and uh, one of my friends her, her advice was just talk like you're talking to me like right now like why are you yeah. sounding like this crazy announcer person just talk yeah, yeah. absolutely, <laughs> it's, absolutely. So hard. it's so hard to do that <laughs> yeah <laughs> Well, this is, yeah, I completely agree with that. So you're in Amsterdam right now. How did, how did you go from modeling to, to biochemistry? Yeah, okay, so that, I guess, yeah, my, my life has been a, a, a squiggly line in all directions. Mm -hmm. So I think while traveling a lot on my own, just backpacking, but also traveling as a model, the more of the world that I saw, the more I realized that there was one fundamental thing that I was drawn to, and that was human health and health and happiness as just a fundamental human right and especially in some of the places that i had traveled alone this was not you know the the standard of living that we take for granted in amsterdam and the united states is certainly not a one that is seen across the world and i think i just realized it it i was so called to this idea that everyone deserves a healthy life and access to information and access to resources that can promote health that I knew I had to pivot. So I, 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 at, at USC, I had been studying when I was living in, in Los Angeles, I'd been studying public relations because I was very intrigued by group behavior. But, you know, I remember one of our assignments was to write a, a tweet for Coca-Cola. And I, I just thought this was, this felt so empty and I wanted to do something just that everyone on this planet could relate to um, and benefit from as a human being. And so I, I realized my, my path would be more in biomedicine. And that's when I decided, you know, I'm, I'm half Dutch. I wanted to experience Dutch culture. So I would move to Amsterdam and study biomedical sciences and, and sort of complete trajectory change from modeling and public relations. But I just felt this deep calling to do it. And I think yeah, I, I mean, my, my life has been just one long string of following my intuition, and I don't regret a single thing. And um, here I am in Amsterdam, so I have a now an undergraduate degree in biomedical sciences, and now I'm doing a graduate degree in biochemistry and biotechnology, all with this kind of obsession of um, understanding human physiology and how it relates to the environment and how our lifestyle choices directly influence how our body is functioning, how we feel in our body. It's It's extremely fascinating and I've become a total nerd. Everything related to the microbiome, uh, all the microbes that are living on and in us that immensely influence just how our brain works, how we feel, how our immune system is working. It's, it's being linked to so many things and I, I love being on the frontier of that uh, in, in science and I ultimately hope to be able to communicate some of those findings, which are often very inaccessible to lay people, uh, to be sort of a liaison between the, the frontiers of science and, and, and everyone who can benefit from this information. So I think that that will unfold in many ways. Um, but that's just one of my deeper drives to what I do. Yeah. Okay. That pivot was, it's, 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 it's <laughs> that pivot, I mean, you were, you were, you were pushing sugary drinks <laughs> into people kind of in the tweet. That's what they wanted you to do. And yeah. now like, that was such yeah. a, pivot. so, that. so I, yeah, I, I, I yeah, exactly. That, that was a, merely a homework assignment. I, <laughs> I know. I, I didn't mean, <laughs> yeah, no, I just think it, it absolutely perfectly represents this, uh, this, disinterest I felt with a lot of things that were just purely about selling. And I do think it's fascinating, you know, human behavior and especially population behavior, health behavior, absolutely fascinating. And I think I was drawn to public relations because it's all about influencing people's behavior. 
um, often influencing in not necessarily the best of ways if you're trying to get people to buy things that you personally don't align with, um, then that, that is, it, yeah. So that's how I ended up here. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I know a decent amount, the a decent amount about the microbiome cause I took antibiotics for about four years as a kid. Uh, so uh, I was trying to recover from that and uh -huh. uh, learning everything I can to do that, but, uh, not nearly as to the level that you've gotten yourself to. <laughs> Uh, yeah, well, yeah, I, I think just the fact that you've taken upon yourself to, to learn what is working for your body is, is actually the, the biggest step. Um, just taking that initiative to tune into yourself and, and pay attention. Uh, I think that already gets you really far. And it's a journey. You know, health is not a destination. It's, it's, it's a vehicle for doing the things that we want to do in life. And every day we, we learn a little bit more and we're a little bit less wrong. Um, <laughs> But it's, it's, yeah. You have a quote on your page that that just made me think of. Oh, yes. My philosophy. I love, yes. That, that, uh, it's a quote from The Subtle Art of Not Giving an F. I don't know if I can say the F word. I'm not sure either. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll just, yeah. I, I think that, um, so I'm a, a big sort of self-help book mm -hmm. junkie. I've read them all. But I really loved this quote because it was specifically talking about how, um, yeah, self well, I, I tweaked it a bit, but that growth can be sort of scientific in nature. And I think the same is true for how we take care of ourselves. Every day you, you've learned something new about yourself. And as long as you're paying attention and, and going through this cycle of, of sort of trying something, but making sure there's that space to reflect and reevaluate and then re sort of refocus and, and redirect, then you're, you're going somewhere. And I think that even just that agency taking that uh, responsibility over your health uh, is something that that changes your life and that you you show up for yourself in that way and you want to better yourself and i think there are you know maybe the people that you are surrounded with um, are also very much in that you know world of trying to better themselves and their bodies but I think that a lot of people have sort of given up on their health, which I think is, is such a shame because the human body is so dynamic and so powerful. And I really hope that everyone can feel autonomy in, in, in their health and that journey. Yeah. You know, I had seen you, you spoke about how you're, you'll eat anything that your taste buds, you'll like anything. Yeah. But how people it's... can change what they like. And I know my wife now makes me, <laughs> avocado, cocoa or cocao, I always forget how you say it, uh -huh. uh, pudding. And like, I think it's the most delicious thing. And we had it my, is delicious. <laughs> we had my family over and they were like, what the hell is this? It's, <laughs> it's a problem. Change. Your taste buds Yeah, change. it's uh. true. Your taste buds change. Um, but this is, so my, your taste buds change and I'm also not a, naturally a picky eater. So it's a problem when I invite people over to eat things at my house because I always, I'm like, I think this is absolutely delicious. Are they going to think this is delicious? No. <laughs> but I think I, I'm usually pretty good at guessing that. Um, well, yeah. That was a lesson learned for me. I didn't realize how much my <laughs> taste buds had changed. Like, well, a, awesome. Awesome yeah. that your ch taste buds have changed to, to prefer healthier choices. And, and, you know, people think that eating healthy is, is um, giving up pleasure or something, uh, which is such a... a a funny idea because I think the second that you start caring for what you eat and enjoying eating healthily, you actually enjoy food so much more and, and just appreciate it on a deeper level as well because it's nourishing your body. Mm -hmm. And then when you get the treat, the treat's so much better. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, that, that quote, I kind of want to read it if you don't mind. I uh, do, please do. I love, I love it. that quote so much. I went and audibled the book. Is that a word? Oh, audible? great. <laughs> it is now because I audible a lot of books. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, it was great. I'm halfway through it. So, so I just read this the other day, but okay. so let, me, let me give it a read for them uh -huh. to hear. So self-care is an endlessly iterative process. When we learn something new, we don't go from wrong to right. Rather, we go from wrong to slightly less wrong. And when we learn something additional, we go from slightly less wrong to slightly less wrong than that, and then to even less wrong than that, and so on. We are always in the process of approaching truth and perfection without actually ever reaching truth or perfection. Yes, I love that. Love that plot. Yeah, it, it's, it's a great quote. With the microbiome, it's, I think it's, 
even more poignant just because we we're still learning so much about it so it's almost like every move we make is a you're getting closer to being right but there's definitely some wrong turns in the way there's so much and and i think this is what really excites me um there's you know people think that we are so far with science which is you know we have come so far in science and technology we can do amazing things now but there's so much more to uncover and to you know and and as far as the microbiome goes we're very sure that it's extremely important but for the rest it's it's a big mystery and and i love uh yeah being on the forefront of that i i I don't imagine myself being a researcher on the forefront of that for my entire life but i do imagine being someone who can make those interesting you know groundbreaking findings more accessible to everyone yeah Oh, that's really great. I know you're involved in the iGEM 2020 competition. Yes, yes. <laughs> it went right over my head. What, if, ex- what is it? <laughs> La- yeah, lactic acid bacteria. Okay, <laughs> so yeah, this is a, a, a biotech competition that's actually born out of MIT. And essentially, it's where students or university teams from all over the world basically design and execute a biotechnology project. And our project is, is not really directly related to human health. It's more about making sustainable biotechnological systems. Um, and I will <laughs> spare the, the details of that because it would get quite off topic. Yeah. Um, but within that project, I've, I'm able to do a lot of research on lactic acid bacteria, mm-hmm. which is exciting because they're not... a, a well, they're in our body, but in biotechnology, they're not typically used as, um, we're we're literally making cell factories. I know (laughs) I'm going to try and, but literally the idea that a, that you can make, so you, you, I'm sure you're familiar with the idea of, of bacteria making plastics, for example, or consuming oil. So basically we're making factories, uh, out of different types of cells. And my branch is exploring factory making out of lactic acid bacterial cells. So, uh, it's really exciting because all the research I do, even if it's not directly related to human medicine, it the information we gain about these types of bacteria and the metabolites they produce are super relevant to what they're doing in our body and the metabolites they're producing in our body. And it, it, I, I'm just, I guess I'm quite proud that this this project, which is very environmentally and biotechnologically focused on an industrial scale, I've somehow still managed to connect to my passion of human health. <laughs> so, okay, okay. Yeah, it's a very exciting time. It sounds that way. It's, it's yeah, it's, it's so far over my head. I'm trying to <laughs> well, it's, it's you know, ball. it is, if you can imagine a, a little cell being a factory for making interesting things, then okay. that's, that's the idea. <laughs> okay, okay. And then you're also part of CRISPRCon, which I just find this CRISPR technology be, to be amazing and incredibly interesting. And you're, you're actually, you're editing people's DNA, like on the spot, right? And yeah, should, so yeah, there's, so, so CRISPR is this I think this thing that has become quite in, in sort of popular media, um, very simplified, and it is compared to other technologies, very a simple way to edit a genome, but it's still not without its, you know, it, um, it's not, let's just say I, I have done a lot of theoretical re- reading about a lot of technologies and then gone into the lab and realized, oh, wow, the, the, in practice, it's a lot more <laughs> difficult and trial and error than in theory. Um, but this, specifically this conference, CRISPR-Con, um, I actually worked with them last year and will be hosting a uh, ideas marketplace discussion in this coming CRISPR-Con, which is virtual, so anyone can attend. Um, but the idea behind the conference is to really bring a societal and ethical viewpoint on this technology. And I think that's really important because um, business people, scientists, people can always be creating things, but it's very important that we're also taking the time to reflect on, you know, how we regulate these technologies, um, the yeah, the ethical use cases of such technologies. So I love that this conference really brings the science to the society. And it's, um, yeah, it, it, it's a discussion that everyone can be a part of. 
Okay. So even the non-technical science people should can still look into CRISPR-Con and they might find things that really interest them there. Okay, I would totally nerd out on this stuff. It's, uh, <laughs> Do I'm, it. I'm afraid. It's virtual to, like, this year. I'm afraid I'll start like trying to biohack myself though on the side or something. <laughs> <laughs> what have you um What have you noticed the difference between uh, like American diets and Dutch diets? Oh. Okay, many things are different, um, but I would say one portion size, you know, I always forget and then I go back to the US and then I go out to eat and it's not just a little open face sandwich like I get in Amsterdam. It's, it's a, you know, a double decker cob this with a million layers. And so, so portion size is one, but I think something minor that is a really big part of Dutch culture that is not at all a part of American culture is biking and people are so active in their everyday lives. And in the US, you know, people are driving 20 miles, going to the gym for an hour and then driving and sitting. And, and, and I, I think it's amazing that people are starting to go to the gym more, but I think that physical activity is something that can actually quite easily be woven. And, and now with the whole stepping culture and, you know, people walking more, I think that's absolutely wonderful. But Dutch people do it without even trying just because that's how you get around here. And I think that really helps um, so that they can still sit on the terrace, enjoy their beer and, and French fries. And it's, it's not the end of the world because they just live a generally quite active um, and balanced lifestyle. I was in Amsterdam, I guess, like 15 years ago. And I just... Uh, 15 years ago, nobody biked anywhere. And I, I remember almost getting run over by bikes. I was the stupid American. Yes, that still, that still happens every day <laughs> for, for tourists having to look left and right in every direction. Yeah. Yes, yes. Uh, I, th is it, I guess they, they've created it just the way of living differently. Because here, you know, I, I commute an hour sometimes to, to one of my work, to one of my jobs. It's, uh, it would just be impossible to bike to work. Yeah, so it's so funny because the Netherlands is a country and the US is a country and Americans like to talk. Well, actually, I don't think they talk about the Netherlands, but Dutch people like to talk about the US as, as this, this country and as they understand a country to be when actually it's probably more comparable to think of the US as kind of like a, an EU situation because you drive for one hour in the Netherlands, you've, I mean, you could soon be in another country and it's just, it's such a small, so I think the entire population of the Netherlands is around 17 million. Don't quote me on that, but it's, it's around there, you know, give or take a few million. Whereas LA County, I think is now 11 or 12 million. So you have to imagine it's, it's a very small country and those distances are also going to be small. So Amsterdam, the biggest city, the big bad city in the Netherlands. And my grandparents were saying, be careful in Amsterdam. <laughs> to me, this feels like a village coming from LA. So it is the geographical dif distances are bikeable and walkable. And it's, it's, it's just very different culture and country. So it makes sense that you wouldn't be able to just walk to work when, you know, it's on the other side of town. <laughs> or another city. And I, I've tried many on many occasions when returning to the US, sort of living the Dutch life, and I'll set out on a, a long walk to go to some park. And, you know, then it's been 20 minutes, I'm on the side of a highway, I'm sweating because it's LA, and there's no one in sight. <laughs> it's the worst walk ever. I've done this so many times. Um, so, you know, it is also just a bit of the, it's the way the country, the US is built, it's really a car culture. And I'm glad, I think cities of the future will be a bit different, um, especially electric cars, hopefully will change that. Uh, so I hope that US cities become more walkable, but for now it makes perfect sense that, <laughs> I got that it's not. <laughs> yeah. Well, with COVID, I think so many people aren't gonna be even going to work anymore. So it's gonna be, yeah. you need to yeah. put extra effort to Crazy. get out of your house and off your chair. And I stand, I never sit down. So I'm at a standing desk, I, I can't stand. Awesome. So what brought you to your company, Health Curious? I was studying biochemistry, as I've explained, um, but realizing very much that the science alone, the science of our bodies, <laughs> is not going to translate to people changing their health behavior. And that's when I started exploring health coaching. And, you know, so many of us know, you know, several things that we want to be doing for our health, but we're not doing them. And so it's, it's not a lack of of information of what we should be doing to be healthy. It's really 
um, a number of other barriers. And a lot of times those are psychological, self-limiting beliefs. And I really uh, began to explore coaching as a way to put the science into practice into people's lives and um, help make a lot of these things that we know, you know, are healthy, like eating vegetables, just actually attainable for people. Um, and, and so health coaching became this more behavioral focused area of my life. And I wanted to create a digital tool for my clients that they would be able to use when I was not in a session with them. And so I started, you know, telling my partner, uh, my partner, and uh, he is a huge tech nerd <laughs> and um, a theoretical physics master graduate student right now. Um, and I started telling him about this digital tools, very simple web app that I wanted to have made and, and if, if he could help me build it. And, and so we started sketching it out on the whiteboard and, and he, he just said, this is, why don't you just make this an app? And, and we started going more into that. And then he, he, we basically landed upon the idea that this is something we could do together because he has the technical know-how. I had sort of the health coaching vision behind it. And so that's how Health Curious was born. And it's really based on coaching fundamentals. And a lot of people I think are confused. What, you know, you hear what a life coach, a business coach, what is a coach? And coaches are really people who actually hold space for their clients to find answers for themselves, which sounds very vague, but you know, we actually, many of us know what we should be doing or how we can be doing it, but there are little things that are blocking us and coaches through guided question asking actually can help uncover those things. So people can come to realizations themselves. So you're not being told you need to do this, this, and this, which no one likes to be told what to do. But when you come to that insight yourself and think, oh, so this is why it's been difficult for me to do this. And if I do this this way instead, oh, yeah. And, and, and that, that realization process is actually exactly what coaching facilitates through guided question asking. And so basically, we've digitized this experience. And I like to call it a soft form of health coaching because nothing can replace the in-person interaction where you are held accountable by another person and you have that deep connection with someone. But there are many uh, ways in which you can already sort of be coached uh, digitally. And that's what we're exploring with Health Curious. And it's, it's, it's very exciting right now. Um, we've taken on a, another engineer and my partner, Jesse, and the engineer, John, uh, are now working very hard on our next version, which will be a huge upgrade coming out this month. So we're excited. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Congratulations. That's Thank great. you. Thank um, you. How does your, how does your coaching intertwine with this? Or Yeah. So I originally made health curious as a tool that could be used between sessions. So a client will have a session with me and then usually there will be a two week period before our next session. And this would be a way that they could still have that um, space in their life where they were reflecting on what was working, what wasn't able to check in to how they were feeling in different ways. Uh, and, and that's how that was born. And now it's sort of its own thing. Um, so I, I do use it sometimes in my coaching practice, but I've actually found it to be even more powerful in, in other just casual ways. Uh, for example, my sister and I use it all the time together and we actually check in with ourselves <laughs> and then share our results with each other. And it sounds very strange, but um, sharing something that is often, you know, a reflection on, on things that are not going well and how you plan to pivot or improve and sharing that with a loved, a, a loved one whom you really trust is extremely empowering. And also my sister holds me accountable now. <laughs> so it's, I realized that there's a lot more than just the simple coaching model that, that that's going on here. There's something very connective and um, yeah. So, so we're just riding that wave and seeing where it takes us. I'm a strong believer in coaching and therapy and, and any place you can go to get the extra help. And uh, the accountability awesome. is huge. Yeah. I do. I'm sure meditation is a part of what you, of what you prescribe. And 
I mean, I, I love Headspace and a friend of mine and I, we text each other our, the quotes from the end of our Headspace meditations at the end of each. Awesome. Yeah. And isn't keeps- that, yeah, isn't that small little interaction that makes it just so much more fun and meaningful and uh, yeah, it, it's exactly that. And, and, and so realizing that not just checking in with yourself, but also being, being able to connect with others over that experience, um, making wellness a bit more social is, is something that we're exploring. Yeah. Oh yeah, no, I tried to meditate for years and I would do it for a few days and then fall off the wagon. So definitely the accountability and doing it with a friend is Aha. Uh-huh. No Very expert, nice. but yeah. <laughs> so yeah, exactly that. So I had the same for a long time. I wanted to meditate and I sort of have to had to coach myself. Okay, so I've been wanting to meditate every day. Why am I not? And so now I've gotten pretty good at coaching myself, but uh, it's different when you have someone outside of you that can sort of yeah. Yeah, it does. It does. Account- accountability with a friend. It's, it's good because they don't, they don't give you an F. They just nudge you a little bit. And yeah. Just, just seeing her, her sending me a text message that she meditated. If I miss the day, it's I feel bad. I have to Shoot. do it. I have to keep up my end of the bargain. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Awesome. What is, um, how, how has the challenge been to start your own business? Have you enjoyed this as much as your other endeavors? Uh, yes. In fact, I feel like I've finally found my home professionally. Um, I think maybe this is just a good personality fit, but I've always struggled physically staying in one place, as you can tell by my traveling journey. But even just the idea of a nine to five desk job was always really difficult for me. Um, And I think a lot of my life, I grew up thinking that I wasn't a hard worker or that I wasn't, um, you know, in school, I was always in trouble because I was looking out the window or talking to someone. Um, But I've just come to realize that the way I work and when I'm in my element, it just looks a little bit different than sitting at a desk. And I have really leaned into that instead of resisting that. So my day typically looks like I am working at all random hours of the day. I go for five walks a day. I'm up and about and I'm writing things on my phone, on a rock, some in the park. It, it's just all over the place, but it works. And it, I think that's a huge takeaway for me um, through this experience is that however you are in your element is, is the way that you should sort of leverage and capitalize on and trying to, and I think a lot of people are probably experiencing that right now through COVID. Uh, the, the work day doesn't look like it typically has. And um, just, just leaning into what feels natural to you is ultimately going to be what gives you energy and where you're going to feel the most creative and inspired. And I've, yeah, I've been absolutely loving that, that entrepreneurial freedom. Yeah. Don't, don't resist what, what might not be the norm if it works for you. It's, exactly. Uh, Very much so. Yeah. Well, it has been a pleasure to speak with you. You're super impressive and I'm looking forward to seeing where your app is when they do the update. And I'm Thank you so much. I'll be sure you. to let you know. <laughs> it was a pleasure to meet you, Michael. Thank it you was. for having me. Well, this has been Second Scene with Michael. We are so thankful for Robin Laird's advice on our health and well-being. You can learn more about Robin at robinlaird.com. That's R-O-B-I-N-L-A-I-R-D.com. If you want more no-nonsense advice or a free one-on-one mentorship uh, in this area or really any other area you're seeking advice or help on, send us a contact request at dweebsglobal.org and we will pair you with another mentor. Tune in next Tuesday for an interview with a young woman who is best known for her yoga teaching, but whose second scene is being a self-described professional nomadic immigrant of sorts. She has lived in places most of us can't even imagine, including Japan, Bali, and an island called Hello Way. Sure, I did not pronounce that right, uh, but those are just a few of the places that she's lived. Um, and I, I know I dream of traveling the world and she's taking it to another level. So we'll see everyone next week. Hey.